Out of worship, family, good morning. Good morning. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the Lord for giving me this precious uh, privilege. I thank uh, Pastor Kevin and the leadership of uh, Art of Worship Community Church for extending grace to me and the ministry for being your messenger today. But uh, every time I get to be invited to minister, it's always a package deal. They asked me to sing and to preach. <laughs> so I'll, I'd like to get the singing part out of the way by singing, if you don't mind. Are you mind? I think I won't sing. Anyway, I'll, I'll just uh, let you in on our backstory uh, about singing. When I had COVID three years ago, it severely affected my lungs, so much so that it it compromised my breathing, and I wasn't able to sing anymore. I couldn't sing. If I tried, it's either that I would crack or cough violently. So I wasn't. I I haven't sang for three years. I but I had peace. Uh, I figured if this season of my life is over, then you know I've I've done all the singing that I could, and so. I was at peace to not sing anymore. But something happened this year, uh, March of this year. Uh, Kuli Desma asked me to be a guest in her birthday concert. And before I could really say yes, because I said, I haven't sang for three years. I don't think I can, uh, but I love you, <laughs> so I'll try. But before I could really say yes, she put my name on the poster. So I was kind of forced. And so I, you know, I was to, to use a, a, a phrase in the Bible, I became a part of the show with fear and trembling because I didn't know if I could really sing. Uh, but March 18 of this year, God gave me a miracle. I was able to sing. Uh, my voice came out. Uh, yeah, you, you feel free to clap. It, it's for him anyway. And uh, I guess the, hello, oh, there you go. I guess the crowd liked it so much that they asked for more, but uh, I was, yeah, well, I only had two arrangements, but uh, so I sang one in a cappella. So that's the backstory. Um, so I haven't really sang in three years, but I would like to trust God that he is going to give me the grace again today to sing. So if we're ready, we'll get that out of the way. Before I knew your name, you knew my every breath. Before I found my way, you knew my every step. Before I knew everything that I need. You gave it all to me, no greater love than this, that you should lay down your life for someone such as me. I'd spend a lifetime one. Drink why the beauty of heaven wants to live in my heart. I know there can be no greater love than this. Mm. 
I never understood how merciful love could be until I found your flame light every part of me and I would give everything that I am cause I have been saved Yes, I have been saved No greater love than this That you should lay down your life For someone such as me I'd spend a lifetime wondering why the beauty of heaven wants to live in my heart I know there can be no greater love than this so is here in my heart I know there can be no greater love for someone such as me no greater love than This is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. That Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of which I am the worst. But for this reason I was shown mercy that in me, the worst of all, God might display his unlimited patience as an example to those who would want to believe in him for eternal life. And this is the reason I sing. Oh man, that song brings tears to my eyes every time because only God could love me. My parents didn't even love me. So I grew up uh, not knowing how to love. I thank God I've discovered what love is. Okay. Um, so I would like to pre uh, preface my message by saying that every time I get invited, I sort of uh, I become anxious because, I mean, let's face it, you know, in, in this particular church, your executive chefs have prepared your spiritual food time and time again for, for, for years. And here comes another chef trying to cook spiritual food and maybe some of you, you, you don't really know me, so probably you're wondering what could be served today. But I would like to uh, just encourage you that I am using the same ingredients. I have done this for the past 35 years, so I've gained you know, enough experience. And I said I would use the same ingredients from the same cookbook, if you might want to use it that, uh, that way. And, and so I would like to cook something for you today. And... I pray to God that it will be to your liking, that you would be able to receive it by faith. So I would like to start off my message by telling you a story. Um, by the way, our, our message today is uh, coming from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. If we could put it on the screen, I'd appreciate it. So anyway, I would like to start off by telling you a story uh, uh, a husband and a wife had a, a very bad accident, a car accident, head-on collision, and the wife was severely uh, injured. But it so happened that the accident uh, was near a house with a signage. And the signage says that the house belonged to 
uh, Dr. Johnson. Let's, for the sake of the story, let's you know put a name. Uh, so basically, the sign says that it is the house and the clinic of Dr. Johnson. So, you know, the husband knocked on the door. Uh, an er elderly man opened the door, and uh, the husband said, "Are you uh, Dr. Johnson?" And he said, "Yes." And what can I do for you? And he says, "You know what? Uh, down the road, we just met an accident, and my, my my wife is badly injured. Could you please help?" And the doctor says, oh, uh, I am so sorry, but uh, I, I don't think I can help you because I haven't uh, practiced for 15 years. And he says, but you're still a doctor, aren't you? He said, yes, but I haven't practiced for 15 years. And so in frustration, as they went back and forth, the, the husband finally said, well, you know what, doctor? Uh, really, you can only do, uh, do two things at this very moment. You can either help my wife or take down your sign. Did you get the point? Yeah. Because the sign says he was a doctor. But unfortunately, he couldn't help. So he said, to repeat what the man says, well, you can either practice again and help my wife or take down the sign. Because the sign is irrelevant. Are you getting what I'm saying? So basically, when Jesus said to his disciples or his followers, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world, if you are a Jesus follower, that's your signage. That's your sign. You are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. Now why are, they, why are the followers of Jesus Christ called such? To what extent? To what end? What does that translate to? And what is the expected outcome? If you notice, again, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, or you are the light of the world. Now, basically, salt and light are not things that you are compared to. Jesus did not say, you are like salt, you are like light. No, you are salt, you are light. Why? Because those two words are metaphors of your identity. You are salt of the earth, you are light of the world. These words are metaphors indicating your identity as a Christ follower. And even more so today, if you read the Bible, basically you are not just uh, a follower of Jesus Christ, you are an ambassador of Jesus Christ. You represent not just the church, you represent not the denomination, you represent his kingdom. It is your signage, it's an indication of your distinction. You are different from everyone else. Now, Christ himself, it's very interesting that Christ himself puts a, a very high premium on that identity on ordinary people. These people who were gathering around him, these people that he was talking to, they have no amazing pedigree, they are not uh, Bill Gates. The, in the family of the Gates family, Roosevelt or uh, Vanderbilt. These, these are not uh, very uh, recognized people. They have no outstanding achievements. They have no impressive credentials. They are not a bunch of sophisticated, high-level professionals, just a bunch of peasants, fishermen, laborers, farmers, basically just ordinary people. Some of you might even be better than them status-wise. And it's interesting that heaven has invested so much to make that identity possible to those who decide to follow Jesus Christ. And the expectation and the intention of heaven is that they are supposed to be change agents. Why? Because salt changes the flavor of an otherwise bland or tasteless environment. And light obviously gives illumination and changes the appearance of an otherwise dark environment. But if you were a Jesus follower, and this is something that Jesus tells you, if Jesus were standing right here in front of you and saying that you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world, how would you process that information? How do you respond to that knowledge as Jesus tells you that this is your identity? How would you respond to that knowledge and live up to that identity? Let's break it down. Let's start with salt first. What is the implication? Well, salt 
out of a lot of things that salt is useful for, I would just like to mention to you two things. Now, you can go ahead and research that. Salt is really uh, a very useful uh, thing that we can, we can uh, uh, benefit from. But today, I would just like to start off by saying that, uh, basically, all of you probably know this, that before the advent of refrigeration, salt was used as preservative. There you go. It's supposed to neutralize or arrest something from further decay. Salt now, basically, the, the application is salt being your identity. Basically, your presence is supposed to neutralize, counteract, or nullify the decay or corruption in your very own spheres of influence. See, salt can be used as a preservative method or preserving meat, fish, or vegetables. It helps to prevent bacteria growth. I was just researching on this and I came across, um, how many of you are familiar with jamón ibérico? Not? Prosciutto, basically same thing. But jamón ibérico is so expensive, especially the real kind. But in order for that jamón ibérico okay, to be useful, to be basically uh, 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 something that we can enjoy, it has to be preserved sometimes for four years. What do they use? Salt. So it preserves the, uh, the ham, it preserves the ham for four years. So that when it's time, you can slice it off and eat it. And if you want to buy it, basically it's at least $4,500 a leg. If you want to eat it per order, it's $25. That's how expensive it is. It got to that point because salt was used to preserve it. Are you getting what I'm saying? Now, basically, if you want to use that same process to a, 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 a leg of a pig, but the salt that you are going to use is not really salty, would it get to that process? I doubt it. This is why we need to understand or we need to heed the concern of Jesus Christ when he said, you are the salt of the earth, but, oops, but what? Every time you see the word but, what comes next will be the one that is most emphasized. But what? What is the emphasis? But if salt loses its saltiness, the question is, how can it be made salty again? Watch this. Here's the concern. It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under foot. Now, the word trampled under foot, the meaning of that is it is deemed worthless. So basically, here's a, 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 la, a, a, a leg of a pig, and you want to produce hamon iberico, but the salt that you are going to use is not really salty. It's not going to produce the same kind of result. Why? Because it is worthless. It's good for nothing. Now watch what Jesus says. If the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? He answers his own question. It's good for nothing. So if the, basically here you are, you want to preserve meat, okay? You want to preserve meat with the intention that it could, it could last four years. So basically, if you rub the salt on meat, but yet the meat continues to decay at a rapid rate, there is nothing wrong with the condition of the meat. There is something wrong with the condition of the salt. It's no longer good enough to do the job. This is why Jesus says, good for nothing. It's worthless. But to be thrown out and trampled under Foot. The idea there is if you are the salt of the earth and you are not salty enough, basically your identity is irrelevant. Your testimony is not going to be taken seriously as a follower of Jesus Christ. So basically what Jesus is saying is that basically your identity is far powerful. And people should take your identity seriously. This is why we need to pay attention to the expression of concern. 
I don't know about you. I don't want my life to be good for nothing. I don't want my life to be worthless. Now, I don't know about you, deep down inside, I mean, let's be honest, deep down inside, you want to be a blessing. Right? I mean, come on. If you, are, if you really want to follow Jesus Christ, you want to be a blessing to the world. Amen? You don't want to be good for nothing. Come on. That's not the intention why you are saved. So now, he says you are the salt of the... Did you notice? Your identity is directly connected to the very environment you're supposed to affect. Salt affects earth. Light affects world. Again, your identity is directly connected to the very environment you're supposed to affect. Salt of the light of the... You are not the salt of the church. You are not the light of the church. Your significance... And your relevance as a Christ follower is not so much felt in here in the four corners of the sanctuary. No, your relevance and your significance, the litmus test of your relevance and your significance is felt out there in the real world. And like what Pastor says, the dark world, that's where you should shine. That's where you should be tasty. Now, as I said, out of a lot of the things that salt is useful for, I'd just like to highlight two. First, again, we talked about salt being preservative. Let's look, take a look at the uses of the use, the usefulness of salt in a different area. Okay. So basically, when we talk about salt, it has something to do with flavor. Okay? Salt changes an otherwise tasteless environment. And flavor has to do with taste. Taste affects your taste buds. Taste has something to do with the tongue. And the tongue, according to scripture, is a very powerful muscle. Why? Because it can build up or tear down. Because the Bible says death and life is in the power of the tongue. What am I trying to say? If you are the salt of the earth, being salt has something to do with your conversations. Let's take a look at what St. Paul, I don't think we have it in, in the screen, but here's what St. Paul says in the book of Colossians, chapter 4, verse 6. Notice what he says, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt. What's he trying to say? That you should carry a salt shaker and then, you know, sprinkle it in your mouth before you speak. No, no, no. This is basically a, a, a figure of speech. Meaning to say your conversation should be tasteful. It should make sense. It should be edifying. It should be gracious. Full, seasoned with salt so that. Every time you see the word so that, what comes next would be, would be the purpose. Why does St. Paul say that our conversation should be gracious and be seasoned with salt? So that you may know how to answer everyone. So basically, you should know how to answer anyone who has a question about who you are. And this is why St. Peter says you should be ready to give an answer for the reason, for the hope that is within you. What is the hope that is within you? Christ in you, the hope of glory. So basically, when people, many people are looking for hope, you carry that hope in you. The hope of God. Now, hope is, we Filipinos, we, we, we say sana. Because for, for us, hope is wishful thinking. Sana. No, hope in the Bible is confident expectation. You are confident that what you are expecting for God to do, He's going to do for you. So basically now, people out there are looking for hope. This world is going crazy by the minute. Especially America. Because men can get pregnant. Now, if they ask you, can men get pregnant? What's your answer? Are you sure? Why? You should know how to answer. Why? Well, in my Bible, God only chose two letters. M and F. He didn't include the whole alphabet. 
In Vancouver, there are 13 genders. How crazy is that? Not only is it LB, they, they put two before that. It's two S. What's two S? Two spirit. Really? What, what, what's the purpose, St. Paul says? So that you may know. Now notice, St. Paul didn't say so that you will know. No, so that you may know. Why? Why, in a very specific sense, why did St. Paul says may instead of will? Why? Because at the end of the day, it's up to you whether you know how to answer or not. So that you may know how to answer everyone. Now, basically, if you answer them, they may, they may accept or may not accept what you say. They may receive it or not. That's, not. that's not your problem. Just be at the right place at the right time and say the right thing. Leave the results to God. But you should know how to answer everyone. This is why if you've been a Christ follower for the longest time, you should know this. You shouldn't be confused. You should know this. So that you may know how to and so, because that is part of your identity, being salt of the earth. So, can you say something about the insanity that the world is going through? I can. I know how to answer. Now, whether they accept my answer or not, that's not my problem. But I know how to answer. How about you? You should. Why? Because that's what the Bible says. Here's basically with in terms of conversations, being salt of the earth has to do with conversations. Uh, this is my disappointment with the Christian community, especially the Filipino Christian community. H here it is. And please don't, you know, don't get offended. <laughs> if you don't mean it, don't say it. If you cannot keep it, don't promise it. Why? Because Jesus says, let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Anything over and above that is from the devil. So basically, when you say something, mean it. If you want to promise it, keep it. Why? Because that is your testimony as the salt of the earth. So that you won't be good for nothing and trampled underfoot. Basically, your testimony doesn't mean anything to anybody. Why? Because you don't mean what you say. No, we are Christians. We are set apart. We're different from everybody else. We sang, about, we sang that a while ago. He is holy. If you are identified with the holiness of God, you are different. That's your distinction. So as salt of the earth... Basically, what, you know, people tend to listen and the desire to seek your advice because of the wisdom of your words. Your words make sense and not nonsense. Now, one thing about salt, it's very interesting. I remembered, um, I don't know about you. I'm honest enough to say that when I was young in the 70s, I used to go to clubs and discos. Anybody? <laughs> Come on. Don't tell me that you're so holy that you glow in the dark. Come on. <laughs> I, I used to frequent discos and because I was part of a dance show, 1007, and they would expect us to visit disco, disco houses. And, and I don't know about you, if you frequent discos or clubs, the moment you sit down, what do you notice on the table? Peanuts, right? Salted peanuts. Why? Because the more you eat peanuts, the more you order drinks. Why? Because salted peanuts makes you thirsty. Get the application? People should be thirsting for your advice. People should be thirsting for what you have to say. Oh, the blessing of people thirsting for sensible words and godly wisdom that you can impart in the midst of all the nonsense and the foolishness around after spending time in your presence. That's a blessing. That, you know, people would remember you. Like some, a lady from Hawaii called up 
uh, it called me up in our house in Vancouver. And I, I don't even know how she found out our number in Vancouver. But she called up and says, Ryan, do you remember me? I said, um, yeah, vaguely. I said, yeah, we were neighbors in BF homes. I said, yeah, yeah, now I can remember. I said, remember that when you were, you know, uh, speaking to me about Jesus, I would be rolling my eyes. I, I, I didn't want to listen to you. And finally, you gave up on me. You didn't want to talk to me anymore. So why are you calling? <laughs> he said, well, I just want to tell you that, you know, I am now a Christian and I married a pastor. So everything that you told me resonated. So basically, when you tell people about Jesus, you're just planting seed. And the Bible calls that seed imperishable. What does that mean? Not going to die. So you plant the seed and somebody, God some, uses somebody to water it, but... Only God can cause it to grow. So much so that they would call you and say, hey, you know what? I'm a Christian now because you said something. I'll give you another example. I was preaching in South San Francisco from a heavy heart because uh, something happened in the house that was not good. So I sat down after the preaching and a Filipino came up to me and says, uh, Brother Rayan, do you remember me? I said, um, I'm sorry, Brad, I, I don't. He said, do you remember 1995? I said, bro, I don't even remember last week. So, <laughs> so 95, tagal na nun. And he says, oh, why? What happened in 95? Well, you know, I was walking aimlessly at, you know, President's Avenue. And that's the main road in BF Homes, Paranaque. I was walking aimlessly. I was depressed. I was distraught. I, because my wife was going to leave me that day. And then I saw you pumping gas. And I don't know what I was thinking. I just went up to you. And I befriended you, I talked to you, and I don't know what happened, but I just started pouring out my heart to you. Rayan, you listened to me. But before you left, you shared Jesus with me, and you prayed that my wife and I would not separate that day. Brother Rayan, may I introduce you to my wife? We are now both serving the Lord. Oh, that was 1995 was the first and only time I saw that guy. Until the time in South San Francisco when, she said, when he said, my wife and I are not separated. We're still together and we're now both serving the Lord. Why? Because of something that I said in 1995. Folks, listen. You cannot even begin to imagine what God can do through you. If you just open your mouth and say the right thing. At the right place. At the right time and lead the results to God. Hoping that somehow, some way, you would come across a person who would say, you know what, I'm a Christian because you said so. Because you said, we told me about Jesus. As a matter of fact, thank you, Lord. Somebody once said, you know, a preacher once says, how many will be in heaven because of you? <sighs> Sobering thought. Let me say that again. How many will be in heaven? Because of you. See, because we are salt, and if we keep silent and don't say anything wise and sensible to counter the corruption and the insanity of the prevailing culture in our very spheres of influence, then the question is, what good is our identity? As a Christ follower, when Jesus calls you salt of the earth, don't you think that you have a responsibility to bring flavor to a tasteless environment? I think so. I think we have a responsibility. Now, unless you don't want to take up the challenge of having that responsibility that is between you and God. Oh, thank you, Lord. Remember the parable of the talents? Do you remember the story, Matthew 25? One was given five, the other two, the other one. What happened to the five? Did business, gained five more. But the two, gained business, uh, uh, did business, gained two more. How about the one? See, the implication of that is the person who was given one was indifferent to the purposes of the master. Just couldn't care. Buried it. So basically, if that is the talent that you are given, the responsibility to be able to share Jesus with everyone, and if you hide it, 
then we have become indifferent to the purpose of the master. And folks, listen, whether you realize it or not, we're going to give an account. Matthew 25 is accounting time. So, let's talk, we've talked about salt, let's talk about light. What did, what did Jesus say? You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Light, obviously, directly affects your eyes. Eyes has something to do with sight. So being light has something to do with what is seen through your actions. Because notice what it says, in the same way, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify the Father in heaven. So being light has something to do with what is seen through your actions, being a visible representation of the kingdom of heaven. And this is why I notice what Jesus says, in the same way, let your light shine. In other translations, you will see the word so. Let your light so shine. Okay? The word so in the dictionary means to the extreme degree. So if you want to use that phrase in that particular uh, uh, verse, let your light shine to the extreme degree that they may see your good deeds, and those good deeds will put God on display. It glorifies Him. So basically, visibility, being a light of the world, visibility is the intention. Okay, notice what it says. You are the light of the world, now watch this. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Notice Jesus did not say a city on a hill might not be, a city on a hill should not, no, no, no. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Meaning to say, can means ability, Meaning to say, a city on a hill doesn't have any ability to hide. I mean, you go through I-5. Yesterday, we were driving through I-5 in the hills. You can see the houses, right? The houses don't hide. You can visibly see it. The implication is, basically, as a light of the world, you should not be a secret agent. You should be visible. A city on a hill cannot be Hidden, meaning to say when people look at you, they know who you are. They know what you stand for. They're not confused as to who you are. They're not confused as to your identity. They know. Even if you don't have to say anything. I'll give you like two examples. One, one was uh, this Christian guy with his wife attended a, an independence celebration in Vancouver. And they were huddled in a group. And then from the back comes in this, you know, loud choreographer. And as he was trying to, you know, join the group, he was cussing and cursing. You know, the PIs, our favorite word. And then when he got to the huddle, it, it so happened that he stood beside the Christian. And then he noticed the Christian. And then all of a sudden he said, oops, I'm sorry. The Christian didn't even say anything. He didn't say, hey, hey, if you want to join us, don't cuss, don't... No. He just noticed a Christian and said, oops, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what? For cussing. Same thing happened in a party. Uh, people were gathered around. Uh, this was a showbiz party. And in comes a Christian. And in the huddle, the person noticed the, the, that this Christian was joining them. And he said, and prior to that, they were, you know, cracking green jokes and, you know, saying profanity. And, and when he noticed the person coming to join the hub, he said, hey, 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 oh, stop cussing, stop the, the green jokes because so-and-so is joining us. He didn't even say anything. He didn't say, hey, guys, I want to join you, but before I could join you, please stop cussing, stop cursing, stop the green jokes. No, he didn't say that. He just showed up. Notice him. They stop. Why? Because they took his identity seriously. He was not trampled underfoot by men. Why? Because they knew who he was. They knew what he stood for. Same thing with you. If you are the light of the world, sometimes you don't have to say anything. People look at you. They know. Isn't that powerful? 
You, know, you don't seem convinced. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just here. I'm just a messenger. Don't, don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> because this is the identity that Jesus places on you being his follower. Now notice. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does a light, or nor does, uh, nor does light a lamp and put it under a basket. You don't hide it, okay? Instead, okay? Instead, you put it on a lampstand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Nabago yung. There you go. <laughs> Right? So a town is not going to be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. You hide it. No. Okay? Instead, you put it on its stand. Meaning to say, basically, the light or the lamp has a specific and a strategic position. Why? So that it can give light to everyone in the house. Notice the next verse. In the what? In the same way. In what same way? In the same way that a city cannot be hidden. It is definitely seen. In the same way that you don't light a lamp and put it under a bowl, it must be seen. In the same way that a lamp has a specific and a strategic, strategic position so that it can be seen. Meaning to say, in the same way, let your light Sign before men. Not so that you can brag about it. No, it's not about that. Let your light so shine before men so that what? They may see your what? Good deeds. And what? What happens? It glorifies the Father. Why? Because you are a representative of the kingdom. You're a visible representative of the kingdom. Whatever you do, whatever you say, gives glory to Him. Hopefully. In other words, a visible Christianity, the public expression of your identity, is God glorifying. This is why your identity is powerful and should be taken seriously because it's an opportunity to extend the kingdom of heaven by what you say and what you do. If, if our environment is not affected or impacted, if we do not leave a mark, make a dent, or make a difference, or create an impact somehow, then our identity has become irrelevant. That's the implication. Now, I have a friend, Dave, from Washington State. He invited me to go to, uh, what's that, Oak Harbor. Every time I look at my car, I would always be reminded that I visited Oak Harbor. Why? Because there's a dent in my car. <laughs> because I was careless in parking. So the dent was a reminder that I visited Oak Harbor in the very same way. Hopefully, people will be reminded that you were in their presence because you left a mark. Even as a little one, you sprinkled a little bit of salt and shone a little bit of light when you were in their presence. So basically, again, just like assault, when Jesus calls you light of the world, don't you think you have a responsibility to illumine your dark environment? Yes, I do. Or would you just rather save your life? You know, you play safe, be a secret agent. Nobody knows you're a Christian. Would you rather save your life by saying nothing or do nothing to leave a mark, make a dent, to make a difference or create an impact in the environment? See, if you want to save your life, what did Jesus say? If you want to save your life, you will lose it. Lose what? Your salvation? No. You will lose the value of what that life was intended to do. You are supposed to be able to impact and affect others. Um, I don't know if I have bottled water. If I can just... Just, just for a... See, thank you, thank you, sir. Okay, now I'll just illustrate this to you, okay, so that you have a, an idea, okay. Uh, in John 10.10, 10, basically you probably know this, I came that you may have life, 
And have it what? Okay, I would like to use the amplified version because the amplified version says, I came that you may have life. Okay? I, may, I came that you may have and enjoy life and have it abundantly to the full until it overflows. Okay, so basically there's a purpose. There's a usage. See this? There's a space, right? You, can you see it? There's a space. So this is abundant. But it's not full anymore because I drank it. Right? A while ago it was full, right? Now, it was full, but it cannot overflow because there's a, a cap. So what if I took the cap out and started pouring water? Put it on a flat surface, start pouring water. Pretty soon the water will rise. And then what happens? If I continue to pour, it will overflow. What will happen to the surroundings? It will what? Get wet. Meaning to say the surroundings got affected by what overflowed from within. Jesus says that he gave you life so that you might be able to enjoy it abundantly to the full until it overflows. So much so that your life within, the life of God within you, overflows so much so that the people around you and even the circumstances around you could get affected for his glory. But the question now is, when was the last time you affected someone for his glory? Don't answer. Because if the answer, if the honest answer is, I have not, then the question is, why not? When that is exactly the kind of life Jesus gave you. But again, you go back to what Jesus says, I came that you may have life. He did not say, I came so that you will have life. Although, obviously, at the end of the day, that's the intended result. But in a very specific sense, he used the word may. Why? Because at the end of the day, it's your choice. Whether you want this life or just go to church. Going to church, doing the church, that's good. But we are supposed to be his church out there. Are you getting this? Hopefully when you go out of this place, you will be convinced. Yes. So basically, the question is, have you sprinkled a bit of salt or shown a bit of light to people who spend time in your presence, in your own spheres of influence, in your own social circles? There are two questions. Have people tasted the goodness of God through you? Have they seen the goodness of God in you? If not, why not? Especially here in America, at such a time as this, when your identity is challenged, tried, tested, or mocked, maybe, either we intentionally and publicly live up to our identity, or let's take down the sign. Because a Christianity that says or does nothing in light of what's happening has become irrelevant. Or as Jesus said, salt losing its saltiness. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Shine, be tasteful, so that it can bring glory to God. That's my time for the day. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for listening. You silence the